Okay, so let's get started on today's Wonder Woman class. I am still Dr. Leah Leach, believe it or not. I am still the headmistress of the Wonder Woman Academy and still the founder of Cal's Guide. Amazing how that happens. Uh, today we are talking about the creator of Wonder Woman and the invention of the lie detector test. They both have one person in common, and that is William Marston. He created both of them, kinda. I mean, with a combination of a whole bunch of other things. And we're gonna, we're gonna get into it. We've got into the Wonder Woman side. Uh, now we're gonna get into the lasso of truth and the lie detector test. And it's quite an interesting story, actually. So I've broken this down into uh, three different parts. The first part is we're gonna talk about William Marston's role in the lie detector test. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the invention itself with him involved. Uh, then we're gonna go briefly into what happened to the lie detector test when William decided to concentrate on comic books. So basically what happened to the lie detector test slash polygraph test after William Marsden. And I am gonna kind of dot point that a little bit because it deviates a tiny bit, but at the same time, I want you to be dangerously knowledgeable of the lie detector test. Um, then we're going to kind of circle back and we're going to look at how the lie detector test was incorporated into the mythos and into the storyline of the Wonder Woman comic book. Um, so we're going to get into it. One of the main things that I am grabbing this from is from this beautiful book, The, uh, the Secret History of Wonder Woman by Jill Lepore. So this is mainly what I'm pulling from. As you will see, I have one bookmarked. It's a particular Wonder Woman comic featuring the lie detector test, which is quite telling of art imitating life. But you need to know what that life part is first to get the glorious references. Like all geeks, we want to know the references, right? Okay, so let's get into it. So William Marston, the creator of Wonder Woman, he was in his junior year at Harvard, I just like saying it that way, Harvard, darling, in 1914, when he designed an experiment to determine whether or not systolic blood pressure could detect deception. It was that simple. Would your blood pressure change if you were lying or telling the truth? Um, it was at this point in his life in 1914 that he met his future wife, Elizabeth, and she was helping with the experiments. So there was 10 test subjects. They also selected a jury of 12. Uh, Elizabeth wrote a story or situation about a friend who was involved in a crime. And the test subjects were to get familiar with this particular story that Elizabeth wrote. Each subject was then asked to tell something that would help the friend, okay? So they didn't have to necessarily know who this friend was, but they just, some advice that would help them. And they got to choose whether they were lying about this advice that they would give or whether or not they were telling the truth. The subject would actually get to choose that. So William used a, a, blood, uh, a blood pressure cuff and yes, we are going to learn how to beat the lie detector test. Totally. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> We're going to learn. <laughs> um, also, I'm going to say this word wrong because it's got like 12,000 syllables in it. But I'm going to say that it's a five gamma nanometer. Seriously, I should spell it in the chat. It's got so many letters. I will probably like put the words over the screen. Spigmometer. Oh my God. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you, spectrometer. Okay, that thing. Really? That's meant a lot of syllables for that simple of a word. Okay, and William could also not see the test subject's face when they did this experiment as well. He sat behind a screen and he could only see the readings from the meter and from the cuff. So to get a baseline uh, of the blood pressure readings, the test subjects were asked to read William James's pragmatism or pra oh, pragmatism pragmatism why did i try to put more syllables in there um so yay i just love those little bits of what did they have to read for their baseline information uh then william asked the questions while the jury got to watch the test subjects uh william was right on truth or lying 96 percent of the time uh, he got 103 subjects out of 106 throughout the life of this experiment. 
the jury got about 50% correct, according to Jill Lepore in the book, The Secret History of Wonder Woman. Uh, so as William finished his undergrad at Harvard, uh, he sent a research proposal uh, to the Special Committee of Tests of Deception, and that was created at Harvard, and he continued there to work on the lie detector. So a very fun fact, um, the motto of Harvard, if you didn't know, that is written on the diplomas is Veritas which means truth. <laughs> it's a little bit ironic. And also, did William take his Harvard, his Harvard education literally with truth being its motto and therefore a lie detector to detect the truth or lying? Or is it just really, really fitting and kind of ironic that the lie detector was being invented at the university whose motto is truth? I will leave that up to you, but I thought it was absolutely ironic. Anyway, William couldn't get a job. <laughs> With all of this glorious inventing and Harvard education, uh, he could not get a job. He tried the FBI, but they turned him down. Uh, the Office of Military Intelligence uh, turned him down. And the New York Chief of Police was not interested in his research with the lie detector at all. Uh, William did not impress people that the test would work for investigation. Uh, so he started teaching. Uh, he got a job as a military psychologist to soldiers, which means he enlisted into the military. William would use his lie detector test in the classroom to showcase the applications uh, to the students. When they ran experiments in the classroom, William's success rate was 97%. William published his research in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminality. A few years later, in 1922, we are talking about now, William went to Washington, D.C. for a graduate course in legal psychology to study testimony at the American University. While he was there, there was this huge murder trial of James Fry, um, and William used the lie detector test on James Fry, and the press came and took pictures as William Marsden was testing James Fry in his jail cell to whether or not he was telling the truth. This story was like a huge splash in the Washington Daily News of this new machine that could detect lies. However, the judge in the Fry case did not like the idea of a lie detector test, and he did not care if William was the expert on the device uh, the judge said that the lie deduction, quote, is what the jury is for. So he's like, the system is already in place. Um, so it wasn't going well for William in a couple of different ways. So he had multiple businesses going at the same time. He liked a lot of irons and a lot of fires. They weren't doing very well either. Um, he wasn't doing well convincing people that the lie detector test had practical applications. Uh, he was also in breach of contract um, and in a lawsuit because a law firm that he started and then abandoned when he went to Washington, D.C. Uh, was up in the air, so they sued him. Well, I mean, they're lawyers, so, I mean, you do what you know. Um, he also had three other businesses, one of them being a fabric company, um, and either one of them did file for bankruptcy or did not file for bankruptcy. It actually is kind of hard to tell, and it's not totally clear, but he was arrested for lying about a bankruptcy. <laughs> yes, the irony is so thick right now. Um, so either he lied that he filed bankruptcy and didn't, or he lied that he did not file bankruptcy and did. So you know what I mean? So th that's where it's like unclear. But he got arrested for lying about bankruptcy. And he also said it in the mail, which meant it was mail fraud as well. So the irony of the inventor of the lie detector test being arrested for lying was not lost on the press at all. They ran with this story much more than they ran with the story of a dude creating a lie detector test. So publicity was, um, was ruining him um, fairly uh, quite a bit. Uh, he uh, seemed to 
need to reinvent himself. And I don't know, maybe convince people that the lie detector could be used in a court of law. Huh, how could he, how could he possibly reinvent himself like that? So uh, let's, let's put a little pin in William for right now and come back to it, even though I know you know all where I'm leading you to. <laughs> So we're going to see now what happens with the lie detector test now that William is ruined. I mean, ruined. Um, so according to a BBC article, the curious case of how the lie detector came to be, uh, the polygraph machine was invented in 1921 in Berkeley, California by John Larson. Now, John, Lars John Larson uh, based his polygraph test on William Marsden's blood pressure test, but he also added more improvements to it. So it evolved from Marsden, but he still gave Marsden credit that he was basing the starter idea off of Marsden's work. Um, the other thing John Larson had for him, he was more in the right place at the right time. When John Larson created the very first machine, it was when police chief in Berkeley was pushing for police reform. He wanted to use science um, to make cops more law abiding. I mean, thank you. Uh, he also wanted to take away the third degree, AKA beating people up for a confession. So he wanted a different way for confessions that were not violent. Thanks, 1920s. Berkeley. Um, so even with a police chief completely behind the idea of the machine and the development of the machine, the machine's credibility was still very much up for debate. So in 1923, the Fry case that uh, Marsden, William Marsden was on, went to the Supreme Court. So in 1923, Supreme Court case of Fry versus the United States. And that's the one where Marsden machine was not yet established enough for general acceptance in the scientific community. And that didn't allow it to be used as evidence or as testimony. And unfortunately, then going forward, so many times people would use the example of the Supreme Court case, Fry versus the United States, that a lie detector or even polygraph test should not be admissible in court. Came known as the Fry test. Uh, so in the 1930s, John Larson's polygraph was backed by Leonard Keeler, who set up a scientific crime detection lab at Northwestern University. This is actually before the FBI actually set up a crime detection lab. Now, ironically, or maybe not ironically, because there is very much a pattern in things, uh, Keeler's class at Northwestern was attended by another cartoonist. Chester Gould based his character, Dick Tracy, on Keeler. <laughs> so now we have Wonder Woman and we also have Dick Tracy that have kind of like combined into the story. Interesting, right? So, but people have been known to trick the machine and people want to know how to trick the machine. Uh, famously, Ted Bundy, the Green River Killer, and Artridge Ames, who was a CIA agent and actually also a Russian spy, and also Sharon Stone's character in Basic Instinct, they all sneak past it. Sorry, I couldn't resist. I mean, it was too fun. Uh, but yes, they all have uh, famously, one of them fictionally, um, you know, talked about how easy it is to beat a lie detector or straight up beat a lie detector polygraph test. Um, there are people who like really hate this machine um, and they say it has no grounding in science whatsoever and that it should not be used. Um, one of the ways that the fault is kind of laid out is that the machine is developed by interrogators and not by scientists. So the application, the intention is actually misguided. Uh, in 1998, the Supreme Court case of the United States versus Sheffer stated, quote, there is simply no consensus that the polygraph evidence is reliable. And that was 1998. In 2005, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals stated that, quote, the polygraphy did not enjoy its generally acceptance from the scientific community. 
So polygraphs are more meant to measure arousal, and I just thought that was hilarious that that's the word they decided to use, uh, but sure, arousal, okay, yay. But uh, what that means is that it also detects anxiety disorders, PSTD, general nervousness, fear, confusion, even hypoglycemia, psychosis, depression, drugs, or even withdrawal from drugs can like totally mess up the test. So any of those things, uh, basically, if you want to try to beat one of these tests, tap into your nervousness, fear, anxiety, like, you know what I mean? Like, just, it goes off the charts, or try to suppress all of those and just go, nam yo, ren, keiko. Um, there are uh, scientists who say, if you just do very complex math equations in your head while answering questions, you'll, you'll pass it. Would straight line. So yes, uh, in a 2018 Wired magazine article, they reported that 2.5 million polygraph tests are given each year in the United States. 2.5 million people are taking a polygraph test, but most of them are administered to paramedics, police officers, firefighters, and state troopers for hiring practices. So the most people that take them are to be hired in a civil service position. And I want to draw the conclusion, and this is me drawing the conclusion, that it is more meant to intimidate than it is actually meant to find out whether lying or truth. Um, that's my thought. It's like, you're gonna have to take a polygraph test and just the idea of a polygraph test can freak people out. Um, and you know what I mean, make them confess or, you know, so oh, this part of my application was not correct, things like that. So um, that is my guess. Now the average cost of doing this test with personnel and everything is about $700 a test. So it's a big business um, and it's mostly on civil service employees. Um, now there have been new inventions that they have been working on, such as the voice stress analysis software. Um, but it's not foolproof, and honestly, I mean, I take one workshop with actors, um, and you're going to see how that test can easily be faked, <laughs> uh, especially if it's voice, uh, voice stress analysis. Um, there's also work on brain imaging, too. It's called a functional magnetic resonating imaging. Um, Garrett Reese, the director of the UCL Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, says this. He says, quote, I don't want to be over optimistic here that we're going to come up with some all singing, all dancing, brain reading lie detection device. This is extremely unlikely now or in the foreseeable future. What we can't do is say that because a particular area of the brain is active, someone was doing something like lying. Any brain area does multiple things, right? So, uh, so then again, as we also said in another one of our classes, people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. <laughs> so I think more research is needed. Uh, more ideas need to be put out there. I do not know if we will get to it. I don't know if we'll get to an actual lie detecting device, but at the same time, I think it's worth exploring because we might learn something about our brains. We might learn something um, about our anxieties. Um, we might actually see, um, you know, progress in a different area from this development. And Teresa wants to know how much the cost of the MRI is. And I am right there with you, girl. I'm thinking the $700 is very, <laughs> very doable for a polygraph test versus an MRI scan of, are you lying? All right, so let's get back to William Marsden, okay? Let's see how he's doing. <laughs> so he could not convince the world of the lie detector test. And you know what? Um, he was kind of right because we're still very much on the fence about the lie detector and polygraph test. Um, but he didn't give up though uh, because he thought well, if I cannot convince the world in person with this practical test, what is another way that I could spread the idea of how important the idea of a test like this is? I know, comic books, right? So 
Some would say <laughs> that you write what you know. In fact, a lot of writer's classes, the very first thing they teach you, especially when you say you are stuck and don't know what to write, they always say, well, write what you know. Well, funny thing is, <laughs> William knew a lot about testimony and law and justice and lying and detection. I mean, he had just spent quite a few years <laughs> actually researching all of that. So of course it makes sense that it is in Wonder Woman's character. So the lasso of truth. Oh, the glorious lasso of truth. Um, so if you think about it, uh, many times we see Wonder Woman swing in that lasso of truth. Uh, and she swings it like around a bad guy, like she's roping a wild hog at a rodeo, right? Uh, that lasso of truth always when it's like why not ends up like right about here which is you know right below the neck right above the chest well isn't that usually where they put the lie detector strap around you like in the old time you put it it's like oh well that looks familiar so those those images kind of like mirror up a little bit <laughs> so but in the wonder woman movie with gal gadot uh, Gal Gadot, sorry, I keep forgetting. Why would you pronounce a T? You pronounce the T. Um, Steve, Trevor, ah, Steve. Uh, but Steve will take the lasso and he'll wrap it around. He wrapped it around his wrist at one point um, to prove that he was telling the truth. Uh, because in the previous scene, he was in a room full of his superiors where he was lying. Oh, so I mean, he's a he's a spy. So you need. <laughs> You need a way to be able to tell in what room that boy is got a story straight and I mean well not straight but you know what I'm saying like what side of the truth he's on at that moment so I can see how a lie detector and Steve <laughs> really 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 helps so in the comic there is a variety of different origin stories that kind of really oh I almost said tie in they do they tie into the lasso of truth <laughs> Sorry, it's a rope. Um, so starting uh, with the original comics that William Marsden was um, involved on, the lasso was created by Aphrodite's magic girdle by the Amazons. I mean, I hate that it's a girdle, but it's a girdle. It's basically a giant belt. Um, so the lasso could make one person or a group of people tell the truth. Generally, when it had a group of people, it had less, um, less power to it, you know what I mean? It, like, um, it diminished a little bit, its battery, if you will, <laughs> wasn't as powerful when it had a group of people than when it had one person. Uh, the lasso was also unbreakable, and it was infinitely elastic, so it could be as, as long as you need it to be and as stretchy as you need it to be. Later, the lasso was coated in special Amazon chemicals. I want a formula and some details of what Amazon chemicals these are, but I love, I love the vagivity, vagivity, that's not a word. I love how vague it is of Amazon chemicals, but again, this is comic books. Uh, but it allowed the lasso to transform then Diana from her regular everyday clothes into her Wonder Woman armor why there needed to be Amazon chemicals to change clothes, I don't know. <laughs> what apps? Uh, but it was too funny not to mention it because it's one of the lasso's powers to change clothes. Yay, it's a closet. Um, so the next origin uh, of the lasso that was created, that it was made by Hephaestus, uh, he was the god of metalworking from Bonnie's class, the one uh, that made all of the wonderful tools for the gods. Uh, so it was still made of the golden girdle of Gaia, um, but Antiope wore it once. So that kind of gave Antiope, Antiope is um, Princess Buttercup, sorry, in the movie Princess Buttercup, that's how she is, it's Robin Wright then. <laughs> uh, so the lasso was still unbreakable in this new reimagining, and it could still change lengths. Uh, what was added to it, it's that um, its power could restore lost memories, uh, it could cast hypnosis, it could dispel illusions, and it could protect from magical attacks. So basically it kind of, it controlled the brain a little bit more and memory a little bit more and was a lot more magical. So it was the, 
the time of magic. My guess is I don't have a date on this. My guess is the 80s, y'all. <laughs> that this is when it just became seriously magical. Um, so then there's another origin story in a reimagining uh, that the power was from the fires of Hestia and for truth telling. Um, and it wasn't just truth telling, um, it was to tell and to understand the absolute truth absolute truth. This powerful force could make people face the truth of their actions and not everyone could deal with it like deal with it. Uh, there are storylines of Artemis driving a man to suicide after trying the lasso of truth on him to face what he had really done. So it got deep. Uh, the lasso can be stolen by other people. Uh, the villain genocide, because of course there's got to be a villain named genocide, because again, it's comic books. Uh, but genocide not only took the lasso, but had it implanted in her body and used it to attack her victim's souls. That's taken the lasso of truth to a whole new level. Uh, in the new 52 line, which is the most recent uh, comic book line of Wonder Woman's reimagining, the lasso is called the Golden Perfect. That's what it's called, the perfect or the golden perfect. It is a relic of the Amazons. It is a symbol of trust. The lasso requires the purest heart in order to wield it and the lasso will choose between two people, if it needs to, to determine who is more worthy. So, yeah. Um, it was tethered to hearts and minds together so that they could better understand each other. That was one of the new powers that the lasso could do, that you could tether two people and their hearts and minds would understand each other. It could create a telepathic rapport between two people holding it to be able to read their minds. It also helped with language translation, which I think is weird because Diana knows so many languages and, but sure, but it could help with language translation. So maybe somebody else who didn't understand all the languages could hold on to the lasso and then they would understand the language as well. Um, it also could share with uh, memories. So it could actually pass through uh, memories from one person to another for them for an empathy device. Um, now, it also forced and bound one to face their own falsehood. Uh, according to the DC fandom wiki page, which I love, but I have to read it verbatim because this gets a little too nerd speak for me. But it says, individuals who have gone through altered in a metaphysical manner are forced to undergo a biophysical reset when ensnared by the lasso, making it enhanced and revert back to their base self. There you go. So that's also what the lasso does. <laughs> I was kind of like, what's going on? So I think it's basically they are, um, they're, if they are entranced in some way by a magical spell, the lasso can make them come back to their regular self. Well, if that's what it is and why it's not in simpler language, I don't know. But anyway, okay, so let's go back to the first issues with Marsden, because that's kind of how the lasso kind of evolved uh, throughout the time. So going back to those first issues with William Marston at the helm, uh, as early as comic number three, Wonder Woman, uh, as Diana Prince, is seen administering a lie detecting test, like number three. I mean, it could have been a number one, but it's definitely a number three. Uh, the issue was called A Spy in the Office. You know. Uh, then in comic number seven, Steve Trevor, my favorite person in the world. Uh, but Steve Trevor is then seeing, uh, administering a lie detector test to a prison doctor. All right. Uh, but there's this really fun one that I totally want to share with you. It's from 1945 of the Wonder Woman comic. And Wonder Woman, she's, um, she's on the jury stand, or not the jury stand, she's on the witness stand, okay, in a courtroom. <laughs> 
And the judge wants to know her findings in a particular case that she is a witness for. And she says, I'll do you one better. And she puts a person in the lasso of truth and there are gasps and there is objections all over the place. Um, uh, it's a little life imitating art. Uh, and then it shows the judge thanking Wonder Woman for her invaluable advice. So I kid you not, let's see, this is the Wonder Woman comic. It is backwards to me on the screen. Otherwise, I would just like straight up read it to you. Um, but she's on the stand. She totally lassoes somebody. The judge like, oh, hell no. And then the judge is like, you're awesome. We couldn't have done this without you, Wonder Woman, and your lie detecting test of the lasso of truth. Art imitating life much. Trying to rewrite history in the Fry case much anyway so what else we all work it out in different ways i mean i'm sure he had access to great therapists but you know <laughs> but that's another way to work it out um so you you get the idea uh that he's trying to put out there that even though the science isn't backing it um and people aren't being sold on the uh, on the idea you turn to mythology you turn it into a story. You turn it into your heroes accepting it as truth. Your heroes using it in a practical application. Um, you just sell it. <laughs> you sell it in a new way that is way beyond the science aspect of it, which I just think is it's so interesting. I don't want to say it's commendable, but at the same time, like A for effort, man. Like, wait, good job. <laughs> you, you tried. You didn't completely give up on it. You reinvented it, but also weird at the same time. Um, but I like that he did turn it into an idea, okay? Into a story, into a narrative. It's still something that we see a lot of time in movies and TV shows using the lie detector test. And it's just that, it's used in stories where the outcome is written down. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not so much being used in practical applications because it's mm, a little bit suspect. But when you turn something into an idea, I always think of Evie from V for Vendetta. I don't know if you guys have ever seen V for Vendetta. It's a movie with Natalie Portman and Agent Smith from Matrix. Sorry, he's always Agent Smith from Matrix. That's just his name. Um, <laughs> But there's this brilliant quote of V for Vendetta, which is another comic book, by the way. <laughs> so there you go. So comic book within comic book. But this is what Evie says. She says, we are told to remember the idea, not the man. Because a man can fail. He can be caught. He can be killed. He can be forgotten. But 400 years later, an idea can still change the world. I've witnessed the firsthand the power of ideas. And I've seen people kill in the name of them and die in defending them. So William Marsden's idea was how to detect the truth. And I think that is still a very wonderful idea. Even if the practical application doesn't make sense right now, ideas don't die. So I think the, the idea is sound. So I thought we would start our uh, discussion debate, and then if you need to yell about Steve Trevor like I do, 